Necrophilia, also known as necrophilism, is a sexual attraction or sexual act involving corpses. It is classified as a paraphilia by ICD-10, published by WHO in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual DSM, of the American Psychiatric Association. Rossman and Resnick 1989, reviewed 122 cases of necrophilia. The sample was divided into genuine necrophiles, who had a persistent attraction to corpses, and pseudo-necrophiles, who acted out of opportunity, sadism, or transient interest. Of the total, 92% were male and 8% were female. 57% of the genuine necrophiles had occupational access to corpses, with morgue attendant, hospital orderly, and cemetery employee being the most common jobs. The researchers theorized that, either of the following situations could be
According to the American DSM-5, necrophilia doesn't get its own spot, as a tried and true mental illness. It belongs to a broader category called paraphilias, which is sexual attraction, or practices with people or objects, other than genital stimulation between consenting adults. The only reason that, necrophilia is on the list, is because the dead cannot consent. Aside from that, necrophilia is not all that odd, psychologically speaking. While most of us recoil in horror at the idea, due to the innate human tendency to be afraid of death, a dead person was once a living person, while objects were not. Surprisingly, nailing down exactly, what makes necrophilia a mental disorder, has proven rather challenging. According to Martin Kafka in the paper, the DSM diagnostic criteria, for paraphilia not otherwise specified. There really isn't much new data on necrophilia, besides a 1989 study by Rossman and Resnick. In the aforementioned paper by Kafka, he writes, Necrophilia could be considered, as a fetish variant, as the sexualized object of desire is non-living but, in my opinion, there are insufficient data, to empirically support this change, to include necrophilia as a subtype of fetishism. Necrophilia can be accompanied by sadistic acts, and sexually motivated murder, certainly not behaviors associated with fetishism, as it has been currently defined. This means that, the only real reason, that necrophilia may be a sexual fetish, is because a dead person cannot consent. Which is kind of a bizarre hitch to have to fall back on.
rather than people getting into a field, which provides them with an opportunity to carry out their necrophilic fantasies. People who end up as regular necrophiles may tend to be in those careers by chance. This provides them with an opportunity to have sex with the dead. When that opportunity presents itself, they take it. Practicing Satanist and necrophiliac fantasizer Nicholas Klotz, aka the Vampire of Paris, started his fascination with death from an early age. Feeling like an outsider while growing up, Nicholas started lurking in graveyards at night and breaking into mausoleums. I woke up one day, feeling this sinister urge to dig up a corpse and mutilate it. And that's where it all began.
started to indulge in the act of eating strips of muscles from the body and drinking bags of blood after adding protein powder or even human ashes in some cases. and dead people was because she was known as a necrophile, someone who becomes excited and aroused in the presence of dead bodies. It's very rare. Not all necrophiles get their kicks simply hanging out at funeral homes. Some of them get their kicks by creating a dead body out of someone that they killed. It is not so much a disorder, it's not a mental condition, it's more a fetish. It is something that brings pleasure to someone. Just like people who like to suck on toes to bring themselves pleasure, some people like deceased. They like viewing deceased. They like viewing things about deceased bodies.
touch the body? Yes. Do you caress the body? Yes. Do you kiss the body? Yes.
was a necrophiliac in the truest sense. reputation around town as odd yet harmless. Behind closed doors, however, he struggled to cope with life after mother. Psychiatrists who interviewed Gein concluded that during the years after his mother's death, his psychological problems crossed the line into psychosis. Mr. Gein's mother as death affected him tremendously. He had no other person to communicate with or talk with. And uh, consequently, uh, he just turned to his inner fantasies, his other interests, and found that uh, without mother, uh, he didn't know what he was going to be doing. He would come home to this empty, uh, decaying farmhouse. Again, that was without electricity. Um, that was without indoor plumbing. Uh, he, he was completely, completely isolated. Gein's mother had left him terrified of human contact, of women in particular. His loneliness, however, drove him to seek his own perverse sort of companionship. At some point, Gein said, he began to make nighttime raids on local cemeteries. Ed was a uh, reader of the obituaries. He was fascinated by who had just passed away. Ed would find out when the service was going to be, uh, where the burial was going to be, and as quickly as he could get there in the dark of night, he would go and open that grave and get that body. Mr. Gein substituted seemingly dead bodies for the activities that he had with his live mother before. If mother was gone, he needed someone who literally could take her place. Gein took these desires to ghoulish extremes though it remains a mystery if he ever engaged in either sex with the corpses or cannibalism, some of the discoveries police would later make defied comprehension.
One night, in April 1933, Carl imagined the ghost of Elena agreeing to marry him. He said her spirit begged him to take her from her grave. He was elated. He had waited two years for this moment. Finally, he had won her love. Carl then hatched a plan to finally bring his bride home to their marriage bed. He gingerly removed her fragile body, now heavily decomposed after two hot years in the Florida sun, using a toy wagon to transport it home. Once home safe, Carl and his new bride enjoyed their first few days together in wedded bliss. Typical honeymoon it was not, with Carl carefully stringing her bones together using wire and coat hangers. He replaced her shriveled eyes with glass ones, finally being able to gaze into her beautiful eyes once again. He carefully fitted a paper tube into her vaginal area so they could finally be united as husband and wife. It had been over five years since they met, two since she had joined the land of the spirits, and the time was finally here for them to share the marriage bed. Coral took great care of his fragile new bride. As hair fell from her scalp, Coral created a wig using hair that had been taken from Elena's corpse before burial. He didn't scold her for the various odors and scents coming from her body. After all, it was only natural. Instead, he used various perfumes to help mask the odors and other agents to help slow the decomposition process. Carl filled her chest cavity with rags to keep her womanly shape and dressed the corpse in clothes, stockings, jewelry, and even covered her delicate hands in gloves. Most famously, Carl also covered her decomposed face with a specialty made mask. For seven years, Carl enjoyed wedded bliss with his beautiful bride, although some might have been disgusted at this thought of sleeping in the same bed with a severely decomposed corpse. Carl enjoyed every minute of it.
if I couldn't keep them there with me whole, I, at least I felt that I could keep uh, their skeletons. And uh, I even went so far as planning on uh, setting up an altar with uh, the uh, ten different uh, skulls and skeletons. Yes.
One, no consent. Sure, the dead cannot give consent to sex, just like dildos, flashlights, and blow-up dolls. That's not a problem, though, because we don't need the consent of inanimate objects to do whatever we please to them. Once consciousness is over, that's all a cadaver is, an inanimate object with no volition and incapable of experiencing any sort of trauma from non-consensual activities. 2. The family of the deceased. The shock or distress that might be experienced by the family of the deceased is an argument often made, but easily dismissed. We do not typically consider the reaction of other people when deciding on the morality of an action. We only consider the harm inflicted on those involved in the action. It doesn't matter that homophobes or racists get upset by homosexual or interracial relationships. As long as all the parties involved in those relationships consent to them, in this case the only party being the necrophiliac, they will be considered morally acceptable. 3. Health Risks Corpses do not intrinsically pose a health risk. The health risks that corpses might pose are those arising from improper disposal or highly infectious diseases contracted by the deceased. That means that if the body of a healthy person is adequately handled by a mortician, it is no more dangerous than a living partner who might have an STD. And we don't even consider exposing yourself to STDs immoral even if it is unwise. The only potential issue present in all corpses is the production of cadaverine and putrescin, substances that are toxic if ingested in large doses. However, they are much less toxic than spermine, a substance found in semen. So it seems that swallowing semen after a blowjob is much more of a health risk than having sex with a corpse. Conclusion And so... All the night tide I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride, in her sepulchre there by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea. Don't kink shame. Necrophilia is disgusting. Who in their right mind would want to discuss something so abhorrent? If you like to spot corpses, there must be something wrong with you. How could you have that disgusting fetish? It's just gross and sick and twisted.
It was like diving into a lake. Sudden cold and silence. Their bodies floated, solemn and shimmering. I watched their lives flow out, who they were, what they'd done. burned like I was touching dry eyes and all I could see was the light I looked right into 